it's a nice cozy room we have here with a lot of friendly faces. Uh, so I, I would suggest uh, humbly that we make this an uh, interactive session. Um, I think all of you agree to that format. Uh, but before uh, we begin in earnest, uh, it's an honor for all of us, obviously, to listen to um, some opening re remarks um, from uh, Mr. Raghunandan, who is whose experience uh, across um, telecom um, speaks for itself. Uh, he's, uh, he's a true veteran, uh, if any, in, in this space. And uh, today we're talking, sir, in a, in a binary. Uh, that is to be provocative. Uh, you need not be provoked. Uh, but, sir, over to you to give us some guidance on how uh, we should proceed on the session in terms of uh, how you would frame the discussion. And uh, then we can do a quick round uh, of opening remarks from everyone else. Over to you, sir. You can use the podium. Good afternoon. I think uh, thank you, Mr. Raghuram, and my fellow panelists. Maybe a little of audience, I must say. Normally, it used to be very challenging after lunch, but now I found it now a little more challenging after tea time or during the tea time. The audience have substantially reduced. Really, at least with a limited audience, we will tweak ourselves what exactly the... Um, I will just share my thought process for uh, five minutes, then I would love to have a more interaction uh, than actually monologue giving a speech or a talk or whatever it is. So since I have happened to give a keynote, so instead of keynote, I'll say that few of my key thoughts, which I will share. So first of all, I have, will uh, uh, rather speak about the theme itself. The free ride was the, the very first uh, say, word, so which I had little concern. I was talking about my colleague about the free ride and then uh, the rest of the topic about uh, the cycle and then about the OTTs, etc. So what I am just telling you is that, um, instead of that, we can say that the collaborative approach for the uh, carriage services as well as the content providers. So that may be a right, uh, uh, the theme for the discussion itself. Uh, maybe I would uh, request the moderator to have the focus on the collaborative approach. Uh, because this free ride is one of the, there are several models on the carriage services and then uh, all of you know, the, the, there is a subscription model, there is a hybrid model, there is a free way model. There are many models are there. So nothing is going to be free in this world. So definitely there has to be some component somewhere that has to come into picture. So that is the uh, main thing. And then morning also, my chairman, Troy, has told about uh, certain his thought processes will change. He has uh, given uh, his thought processes. I will speak on that one or two minutes on that. So the total five to ten, six minutes I will speak. Then coming back to the collaboration, collaboration is the new mantra. The new mantra, without collaboration, nobody can uh, actually uh, continue with the business. Morning, I think uh, Mr. Rahul was not there for his uh, information. Mr. Gopal spoke for 10-15 uh, minutes. So one of the key, the total his speech was the concern of having, uh, I am not able to monetize my network of 5G carriage service. So carriage service, his focus was I'm not able to monetize. So that means I need a content provider, and the content providers are not keeping pace with my requirement. So that was one thing. So there is a definitely, so unless I collaborate, I'm, I'm a carrier service provider, unless I collaborate with the content provider, I will not be able to monetize my network. And then he also specifically told, I will not enter into the content business. Do you all, have you all heard about this? We will not enter into, majorly into the content providers, content provision, co content creation. So that is, means every content provider has its own inno innovation, content providers will have the innovations. So they will, just five minutes before we were discussing about, discussing about uh, the film, I think uh, those audience have left actually, but perhaps it could have been a uh, nice thing to listen to them too. With the content provisioning, definitely content creation definitely has its own innovation. It's not that uh, being a carrier service provider, I will, create the whole content. So never actually the carriage service, service providers completely, completely get into this and then do this. And the content providers do not have the capabilities to uh, uh, do the carriage services and then ensure that. Whether it's in the broadcasting service, 
But Chairman Fry has told that the divergent the uh, stakeholders, the broadcasters, they are nothing but content creators and providers, and then the BPOs and SOs and then the LCOs. So that, that is an, another. That is again a carriage service providers. So we had dealt with the subject there also, and with the telecom also. So they now the because of the the emerging 5G uh, carriage services, carriage going through the, uh, the, the the sorry, I mean to say the content going through the flowing through the 5G carriage. I must say that. So now again the content providers they they, they are not able to meet. But wherever supposing if I am able to provide a content, then I need the definitely a carriage which can uh, um, match my quality requirement to be of, of that. So for example, now somebody was talking about the meta. So meta, I think madam, we had a number of discussions. I provide a meta, but then again, so from the current day services of web 2.0 tomorrow, I move on to a web 3.0 and then maybe beyond that. Then again, I, I need a network or a carriage which can carry, carry and then reach out. So that is one thing, that is another challenge. So it has to be collaborative. It has to be collaborative and then it, it is going to be collaborative whether you accept or not accept. It has to be collaborative. So collaboration is the new mantra and realizing that the collaboration will be the new mantra, ITU had actually come up with a regulatory benchmark itself where the regulators who do the collaborative regulation, they will be categorized at the highest, the G5 ranking. So generation 5 ranking actually. And then I am happy to share that we had actually, our chairman try also has told, and then we had actually done the collaborative regulation. For example, we have formed a joint committee of regulators where we had a, a, a n number of meetings and collaborative meetings with the financial regulators. And we had a forum for uh, regulators where we had a choir is there, where we had actually done with the power regulators. And then quite a lot of uh, recommendations we brought in. Maybe another two minutes, if you give me that. We have done the collaborative regulation. And then we entered into the G5 domain. And then we have to continue. It has to be sustained. We don't, it is, why it has a G5 uh, uh, rank, uh, ranking has been brought in by the ITU? It is, it's 193 countries have deliberated and then brought this. Thinking that the future carriage and the future content, everything of the telecom, need actually it is across cross sectoral and it is it across cross sectoral and cross border and then whatever you talk about cultural everything will come into the picture so that is the reason why the collaboration is the new mantra collaboration is the new mantra so our focus should be collaborative approach for the content providers and the carriers or services providers and how best we monetize each others and then how best we come together so that should be the focus of our discussion then of course uh, our chairman also has told uh, the, the new innovative players when they come, there shouldn't be actually, there should be have a light touch. Light touch, so that the existing, I, we do agree, the try also agrees that there are legacy issues which we need to address for the existing players. We are concerned about that, we are working on that, how best we need to take forward, we have to think about it. We are for that, we are for that. Our chairman has very, made it very un, uh, absolutely clear that new entrants so that new innovation should come, the re less regulation or the very light touch regulation. That is the new mantra of the regulation. So that is what I wanted to uh, say something about it. And then the India, how it become content leader. And then especially meta, meta coming and uh, other things uh, coming up. Definitely without carriage, without 5G providing the carriage services, AR, VR technologies will be nowhere, AR, VR and all. You can only experience when actually 5G is there. I myself experienced, thanks to Rahul and Ben, we had been to Barcelona many times. There we'd experienced, 2017 onwards I have been experiencing that. I have never experienced in actually in India. And thanks to them that last year it was launched and then we can experience all those things. And it is going to tremendously transform, the, especially in some of the use cases in education, etc. So that again, the, develop, the use cases have to be developed. They have to come together. So this is another thing. And uh, of course, uh, the convenience of customer anywhere watching content, anywhere and everywhere, that brings in the carriage services to be brought in everywhere. So that again, 5G new carriage services has to be across. So that definitely, if they are not there, content providers cannot 
exist, and then if content provider is not there, carrier services do not exist. So this is absolutely clear, and then we need to have a, a proper quality of service and proper quality of experience. For that, try with only those aspects I would like to touch it. Definitely quality of experience, quality of services, this need to be touched. And of course, about the investment uh, promotion, definitely India has got a strength, especially in the software. And then we were earlier going somewhere and then developing. The carriage coming to the each and every place, the, it gives a great immense potential for the uh, uh, content uh, creators and then innovators in India, the startups and other ecosystem developing. It is going to transform India, certainly. And then we are going to have a huge jump in our uh, the co contribution of telecom in the GDP will is going to be substantial, maybe 6 to 8.5, that is the, uh, our uh, thinking. So with this few quotes, and I thank all the organizers, and maybe a larger audience would have been nice to interact. So I would uh, interact with the through question and answers if anything more is there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, sir, even, you know, we'll take the liberty of asking you more questions. Uh, we'll make up for uh, any shortfall that you may imagine. Um, We've set the tone, um, and um, I think without annotating it too much further, I just turn to all of you to perhaps dwell on uh, the theme itself uh, for two minutes, and then we can open it up, which is that why are we seeing this tussle in the first place? And, uh, you know, does, over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of changes um, in the way that we live and consume and produce, and uh, there is a layer of COVID upon all of that. Uh, so we're seeing globally this tussle play out. This is not some localized phenomenon. Um, during COVID, it was assumed that the pace of digitalization would be at a certain rate, and I think there has been a natural connect correction from there on. Uh, and perhaps some of this is a corollary to the commercial imperative that followed. Uh, but maybe there are other uh, dimensions to this, and uh, if you can draw out the similarities or differences uh, in terms of the global debate uh, between telcos and uh, digital application providers uh, and those in India and the similarities. Um, that would leave us with a good frame to operate within. So uh, over to you, uh, uh, Mr. Ramachandran. Uh, Mr. Ramachandran is um, uh, the founder uh, of uh, the Broadband India Forum, which is a think tank, uh, does a lot of very cutting edge work um, in all these fields. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Vivan. Um, Vivan, you were very true in your opening remarks when you said you would be provocative to challenge uh, Mr. Ramachandran. And I'm going to provoke you. I think that's exactly right. All this is much ado about nothing talking about us versus them, OTTs versus telcos. I don't see it. I've been a telco most of my life, and now I'm in the Broadband India Forum. Uh, the two are as different as chalk from cheese. Make no mistake. I don't want to take up time now. If we get time, I'll talk about why they are different, how they are different. So they're completely different. And uh, if you look to the world's highest telecom body, which is the ITU of Geneva, or you look to European Commission, ECC, they very clearly have gone into it chapter and verse and said the two are different, they are symbiotic, there is nothing to be worried about in getting into conflict on these things. So it's good to have a conflict, we have an opportunity for a session and therefore we talk about it, but in real terms, they need to work together. It's a symbiotic thing. Neither can exist without the other. And uh, as you said, COVID has rightly shown that. In COVID, the telecom pipes would have remained idle if the content were not there given by the OTTs. None of us could have worked, made payments or education or work, video conferencing. Nothing could have happened without OTT or entertainment. So both needed each other, they still do need each other, and the way the industry is developing, we need more and more of that, working together. So that is my main point which I would like to make, and globally, 
why it's happening because the what is seen as a combative situation in some cases is entirely because an incumbent is trying to protect his turf, thinking that all this has to be within that. See, that is classical. Everywhere it will be there. See, um, you can't say the rest of India is not keeping pace with me. I am going ahead. I am far ahead of the rest. You can't do things. We have to go together. And uh, anywhere in the world, you will have that situation of incumbency versus new entrants. Incumbents of today came in as new entrants 25 years ago, 30 years ago. So this situation is repetitive. We should not be worried about it. Let's look at the positive angle and see how to synergize that thing. That is my humble opinion. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think, Mr. Vats, we have had a lot of agreement so far, so let's have a bit of disagreement. No? The uh, responses to the TRAI consultation on convergence, uh, which I think was released in February and uh, comments have been submitted by various stakeholders, we did a very simple exercise of trying to map know, who's answered which way. And actually, we see this binary play out uh, in that we've seen uh, telcos um, asking for uh, more regulation, to put it simplistically, and uh, some distributors as well. But uh, a lot of the associations that represent large swaths of the digital applications uh, providers or OTTs, um, they seem to be uh, batting in favor of forbearance. So there is uh, a divide in as much as how people are uh, advocating their positions. Some of it may be down to incumbents versus new entrants. I'm not sure whether you feel like an incumbent yet. Uh, in India, it's difficult to feel like an incumbent, I think, uh, or get too comfortable in one's skin. But just your opening thoughts on this, uh, Mr. Watts. Thank you, uh, Ivan. But let me start by actually agreeing with you uh, that there is actually uh, no area of conflict whatsoever which I see. Uh, you see, uh, with the growth in the internet ecosystem, uh, there is now a plurality of applications and content uh, on social media. And uh, along with that has been the evolution of telecom networks. Actually, they are working hand in hand. Uh, so whether it's streaming applications that ride on telcos, and telcos also get traffic generated because of, you know, what the scene is happening. So absolutely right, it is actually a symbiotic, uh, you know, relationship which is existing uh, between both. Uh, I, I don't know how many were there in the morning when Gopal talked about. Uh, actually, he told that we have got a network which is like a supercomputer that our capacity to be able to carry, our capacity to be able to reach 2, 3, 30 million people uh, with strengths of speed and latency is so high. Actually, we are looking for stakeholders who can, you know, be partners to us. Right? That's the way actually we see it. As far as the convergence paper is specifically uh, concerned, I think uh, uh, Mr. Raghunandan mentioned, uh, you know, how TRAI uh, has really led this entire sector. I think TRA did two fantastic things quite early uh, you know, in its trajectory, which was they created a situation of a must provide. So any content which was there had to be carried by everybody. Also, they created very clear rules on broadcasting uh, and uh, you know who can carry them. Right. So typically, a DTH cannot you know be uh, creating content and then carrying it. Right. Those two cardinal rules were set in motion by TRA and long back. Now, what is happening with this evolution of technology and convergence is that those principal rules are getting challenged. Right. Uh, so today, uh, while a DTH or a IPTV is subject to oversight from TRA for uh, for uh, you know tariff, from MIB in terms of licensing and registration. Uh, the cable TV is not subject to any license fees, but it's still subject to a tariff regulation. And on the other hand, there are applications who are writing the same linear content which is being given uh, by DTH and cable, but they are not subject to any registration or license fees or any oversight on tariff. So this is the challenge, you know, which is 
uh, you know, really coming out in the market because we are talking about the same content. And so our request has been that let's look at it holistically. And if there are rules in the game, fine. Let it be for everybody. And if there are no rules in the game, still fine. You know, but then the, there are no rules for everybody. So that's, you know, how we sum up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Gauri, as a lawyer on the panel, uh, you know, interesting point on first principles being challenged uh, by the evolution of technology and therefore the need for a response. And I think we've been here before. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's reminiscent of many debates we have around technology whether to regulate upwards or downwards in response to uh, innovation, the incumbent players or legacy industries. Uh, so what is what are guiding philosophies for this, uh, Gauri, from a legal standpoint uh, that can perhaps respond to some of what is being said today? Sure. So I think the first guiding principle is when, when it comes to India, I feel, and it is in context of what you said before, that we should not and need not copy what is happening outside uh, India, right? Because I think uh, we have seen that happen in uh, GDPR where we tried to, you know, have that overbearing, you know, draft law that we saw. And luckily the government realized that, you know, we need a simpler law for the country to adopt, right? This is just a recent example. So we, can, we should watch what is happening around the world uh, learn from that, but need not copy because India is a, is a is a unique market, and if you see even at the you know diplomatic level or otherwise, India is taking that you know independent strong position. I think that that message should go across in all the regulations. I feel, and we have the ability to innovate even in regulation. I feel, and even in the platforms. For example, we saw India you know coming up with say Aadhaar. UPI, now ONDC, right? There are unique models that we have developed. So I feel even on a regulatory frame of things, we should innovate. Uh, we should create new models. As Sir rightly said, collaboration is the key. That should be the fundamental uh, premise in whichever, uh, you know, uh, uh, discussions we have. Now, to your direct point, I think uh, on, on the principles, right? Uh, since morning, I have been making extensive notes. I, like you, I also like to make notes. Uh, so what I'm hearing is that time has come, and you know, every time we may feel so, but I feel time is right to revisit what we have done before and sort of challenge what we have done before to say that should we revisit and say that okay, you know, just start on a uh, uh, you know like whiteboard to say okay, you know, all these past there is a legacy. Can we, you know, free that, leg you know, legacy from regulations, from business model and the like? Because if you see, just to take the ONDC example again, what I'm noticing is that, you know, the current regulations are getting challenged, whether it is under the e-commerce principles or whatever, right? So when you're creating new models, I think those regulations will get challenged and you'll have to rewrite completely. So I feel we should not fear rewriting completely. So the first principles in so, so far as to say that pipe is different than the next layer and the next layer after that, those principles will continue, right? But I feel that we we should liberalize uh, when you say forbearance, this, that, and the other. And the other third important point I want to bring out is the economy of it, right? Because a uh, lot of time you are hearing that telco saying that, oh, we have invested so much, you know, we have... We need to maintain the quality, we need to maintain the infrastructure, who's paying for that and the like, right? So we have to look at the, the digital India and all these things that you're talking about. I feel that the government also should revisit, you know, some of these things to say, can they give some kind of, uh, you know, respite to the telcos? Then, you know, that the total economy works together rather than, you know, creating that they versus us and that feel for them. I know uh, I wanted to come to uh, Mr. Raghunandan with a uh, rejoinder to what Gauri said, but I know uh, um, Mr. Ramachandran, you had a quick. No, no, please go ahead. Please go ahead. If it's directly related, it's. Thank you, Ivan. I you know something which Gauri raised comes up frequently, and it's a very valid point that oh, we have invested so much. What do we do? Um, are these people free riding? In fact, in that context, I would like to say that the term OTT itself is a huge misnomer. They are not riding free on any network. They have not bashed themselves into any telecom network. It is a customer who is taking the app. He needs the app. 
the customer. And if you don't, if you stop allowing uh, an OTT on your network, the customer may not come to your network. So the, let's be very clear. The customer is using the app. He is wanting the OTT app. So the investment, if at all, the operator has made, he has to see how to get it out of the customers who are using it. And the customers are using it, okay, they pay a data tariff. Let's cut back and realize what term which so, CRA so, has so, said repeatedly so this I'm sure about forbearance. Yeah. Everybody is lauding it. But don't you realize that everything is under forbearance here? The market is deciding the tariff. So why worry? I mean, we, we need to keep all that in perspective in mind while taking a look at this issue. I think obviously Mr. Watts will have a rejoinder to your rejoinder. And just to add to your point on uh, OTT, free riding, etc., there is a, there are multiple reports that point towards about $120 billion of annual spend by uh, OTTs and associated uh, value chains into telco networks globally. Uh, this is a secular trend across jurisdictions and cumulatively $20 billion annually in, uh, in telco infrastructure or ISP infrastructure is contributed by uh, OTTs. But coming back to the uh, regulatory theme, sir, uh, Mr. Raghunandan, um, you know, this whole, you, you spoke of the ITU construct around G5, and that is basically the epitome of collaborative regulation. Uh, and maybe it's possible in certain fora like you gave the example of CERC, I think, and uh, the state electricity regulators, uh, where, you know, obviously you have a common agenda of universal access. And it's very clear that you have to drive towards that, and every politician will agree and will not get in the way of that agenda. But in slightly more complex economic situations and markets, uh, there may not be a unified, unifying agenda for different market participants. And my question really is, also in the context of technology, you have to take fast decisions. Now, how do you reconcile all of these things, the fact that there may be multiple competing objectives, the need for collaboration, and the need for efficiency in any overhaul of regulatory design that you may uh, wish to see in the future that moves us up the pyramid from G3, I think, which TRAI is at, to G5? Actually, you know, we, we are... Uh Maybe slightly uh, uh, discussing this in a different connotation. What she has told is that maybe if it is if it is required, if, if it is required, the regulations need to be uh, whatever uh, new regulations to be brought in, and it's a continual process. At every technological disruption, she then we have to have a, a quick uh, regulatory response to see that the the benefits of the technology reaches uh, the um, all economic sectors or the particular sector, whatever it is, it, it all depends on that. As far as the tariff part is concerned, my chairman also told, we broadly concur with all of them, that tariff part is forbearance. It is not that all regulations, everything is forbearance. No, we didn't say that. See, and then the regulation part, we told that it is light touch regulation, the desired limited regulations. Depending upon the context, for example, now the huge data is coming, then the privacy and then the those aspects are coming, security aspects are coming. Then we need to intervene, maybe, depending upon the situation, those aspects of security, how to address that. So it is not that blindly we say that, okay, we don't respond or we respond uh, through a knee jerk or anything. It, is, it should be a very calibrated response and it has to be very calculated. And then we definitely intervene. Even now, telecom also we are intervening. It is not that uh, it is not it is not hundred percent forbearance. But we intervened limited. For example, USSD, the charges we made it zero. That is SMS uh, charges we made it zero USSD, and we have seen the financial transactions uh, gone up by three times in the USSD. RBI has brought up brought on, uh, brought out actually a specific app for the UPI through the USSD. So that, that is how we limited intervene, definitely. So if you want me to say something more. Uh, Thank you, sir. That's very clear. Uh, maybe, Mr. Watts, you can now make your point that uh, you wanted to make earlier. And also, uh, you know, dwell on this question around 
uh, regulatory design a little bit. How do we uh, keep up with innovation uh, through regulatory design? Uh, thank you. Uh, let me answer the second one first. I think uh, uh, a regulator's uh, role is very tough uh, because uh, there are investments which would have been poured into a market. Uh, there are new technology challenges which are coming in the market. And of course, there is a consumer uh, who is the largest, uh, you know, uh, so as to say, the epoch for all of them to be on. So uh, it's not an easy job. Uh, how do regulators generally navigate? And you know, and by the way, this is also a question in the deeper forest. So we will be crossing out there. But uh, I think uh, uh, the TRA Act itself is a very beautiful document. Uh, you know, if you look at the preamble and the way it is written, and uh, very right up front, it's mentioned that the regulator has to ensure. Uh, orderly growth of the market, right, and protect the rights of consumers as well as the service providers. I think that's a beautiful statement, right? So you have to really balance your interests that you are able to take care of the business to grow and also take care of the, you know, the service providers and as well as the consumers. With that framework in mind, I think what we really need to test every time is that whenever uh, you, first of all, should be able to encourage any new technological innovation which is happening. There's absolutely no doubt. Otherwise, we will be where we were. So you have to allow, give them space to reach a particular point. And once you start doing that, and once you reach a point where you realize that now a framework has, is getting challenged because of the growth, that's where we need to get light touch in our approach. And that's the trajectory, I think, the TRA has generally been taken in the past also, right? So they amend themselves, so, you know, modify their approaches, and that's the way generally, you know, life goes. And then that's the way I think this should continue. Right now, in our sector, there's a double thing which is happening. So on one side, you have got a DD free dish, you know, which is continuing basically free. And on one end of the other end of the spectrum is, uh, is the rise of the OTTs. And in between is this particular layer, which is now getting squeezed out of these two because the regulatory situation is very different in these two. So that's where, you know, our challenge is, which the regulator has to look at. But just to also uh, uh, take back on the part about what you mentioned earlier about the consumers making a choice. Of course, consumers make a choice. But every business has got, uh, businesses are getting two-sided now, right? Uh, so, uh, like an app store does business with both uh, uh, the user of the app and also the people who are putting the app out there. Similarly, uh, when you watch YouTube, uh, YouTube decides what advertisement you are watching. They also decide whether it will be autoplay. Now, that's not a choice of the customer to say, I want to watch advertisement or I should get an autoplay. Or if you put up content and say it's a HDR content and it's a SD content, that's also a choice which you are giving. So it's a two-sided market to be sure, right? So in that sense, every market is two-sided and so that's the way we should really look at it. Right. Uh, Gauri, I think uh, just connected to this is also a trend that uh, seems to be um, visible now in India, and I think TRAI also alluded to it, that, you know, regulators need not wait for market failures to occur before trying to uh, intervene. And this is, again, this is, a, you, you know, appending a, a fundamental premise of regulatory intervention in a sense that we've uh, become familiar with over the last 30 years, that you uh, have a sort of an exposed determination of uh, something that has gone wrong in a market and then you try to correct for it. In the case of innovation, uh, of course, Mr. Watts has made a balanced remark saying that, you know, you have to wait till innovation is at a certain size and scale and um, it has to be visible for you to then start to contemplate a light touch framework for it. Uh, but actually, if you think of, uh, you know, adjacent areas like AI, uh, people like world over and even in India are making the case that by the time you figure out what uh, extreme risk scenarios may be, uh, it may be too late, so you should start intervening. So how do we think of this uh, new trend in the context of telecom and OTT? Is there anything so egregious um, uh, that is likely to happen here that we uh, need a sort of whole of society assessment of uh, how a balanced outcome can occur here? Or is this not one of those areas where uh, we should be preempting harms before they occur? So my initial rea immediate reaction is I don't think this is the space where we really need that kind of a thing. But I think I just want to go back to, so one is telecom versus OTT or whatever, you know, that conundrum. And the other one is the point that he brought about is the broadcasting aspect of it, right? The traditional 
carriage uh, companies and all of that. So wh while we were discussing, I was just thinking, so when you talk about regulation, and this is what Mr. Vadhila said also in the morning, you know, that we had to look at NCOs, we had to look at MSOs as an example. So my question is, uh, just uh, reflecting is that regulations can play two roles, you know, protecting some people who are likely to become obsolete and then controlling the people who are just running too fast. Right? So I think that is where I'm slightly I'm debating myself that, for example, when, uh, you know, CD came in, did we protect that the, you know, cassette manufacturers, they, you know, they, they have manufacturing facility, we need to protect them, no, no, cassette should continue, you know, in the ecosystem, right? So over a period of time, you know, some technologies will become obsolete and we need to recognize and need not necessarily protect those. So that is one aspect, you know, reflecting what, what was spoken in the morning. The second aspect is on the, on the, you know, on the specific thing, I don't believe that we are at any situation like people are talking about AI where we really need suddenly some intervention, whatever interventions have to be done insofar as content control and all of those, those have already been done. Uh, I don't think at this stage there is any further intervention required. So there is this uh, sense that people have somehow still, though it's been two, three years since uh, the IT rules 2021 came out, uh, that some, this is an unoccupied field in a sense, you know, you need a legal construct around content regulation. Uh, and we see this come recurrently uh, even uh, through informed audiences. Um, and, uh, you know, it just speaks to your point that, um, you know, this is, there is an entire slew of laws uh, that uh, content providers are already uh, accountable under. In fact, uh, perhaps even they can make the case uh, for rationalization even with uh, the existing um, uh, liabilities that uh, they are, uh, you know, they, are, they face. Um, uh, Mr. Ramachandran, if I, can, if I can get you in at this point, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Raghunandan introduced a new uh, phrase to me at least, this quality of experience. Uh, you know, have you, ha what are your thoughts around this quality of experience and whether actually a regulator needs to play any role there? or whether competition is the best regulation in a sense. You need to ensure that uh, all app markets which are uh, of, uh, which, which are of a nature where there is public interest in them, uh, remain competitive uh, so that the quality of experience is responded to uh, through the market forces uh, rather than perhaps any artificial regulatory intervention. Pretty difficult question, but uh, this is also connected with innovation and some of the points being made about innovation. Uh, if you permit, I would like to make a couple of additional comments on that. Uh, first of all, uh, how can we promote innovation? That was one question being thrown about. See, the, um, you cannot promote. You don't go and promote a Einstein. If we have an, an, an environment which uh, doesn't have heavy-handed regulation, where, which is technology neutral, and which has low entry barrier. In industrial scenario, that is the best for innovation. If you have high entry barrier, like high spectrum fee, high license fee, then you're automatically putting the backs up of the telecom operators and they'll resist any innovation that comes in. It's but natural. If you're in that, that will happen. Um, so entry barriers have to be low. But today if you ask a telco who has paid huge license fee that government wants to reduce the license fee hereafter, they'll resist it. Well, what happens? I paid. That's a never-ending cycle. You can't have progress that way. So innovation must bear in mind all these. And that's why, like Rahul said, regulator's role is one of the most difficult roles. It's a very unpopular role. He has to balance both sides. He has to know where to chop it off. And uh, entry barriers we talked about. And exit barriers are also very important. You can't get people coming into a market, lock them in and they don't have a way to get out. So, so many complex factors are there in that. We need to know how to balance that. And in going from to a new thing like AI, innovation, my simple question is, how do you regulate AI? Did we regulate the nuclear fission? Didn't we have the atom bomb, which 
don't have a call center. Did we regulate the smartphone? So many complaints are there about people, some people misusing it for all sorts of uh, law and order issues or pornography. You can't regulate it. Human nature is that. 80% may be good, 20% will be that. So you can't stop innovation. You cannot regulate innovation. Like you rightly said, the regulation has to be light, light touch, more post exposed rather than the fancy. But all, as uh, like Sir pointed out, the way the PRA has gone about, our PRA Act, I can tell you in 1997, when uh, FCC chairman came, Walter Reed, huh? Reed Hunt, when he came in and uh, Justice Kogi presented the new PRA Act to him and asked for his opinion, public forum in Hotel Oberoi, I went to, FCC chairman said, I admire your act. I wish I had the same act in U.S. So we have got a very powerful regulatory system. We've got a powerful regulator who is able to balance and take if the section has, if we have become one of the most powerful mobile countries in the world now, next to only China, it is because of the play of regulator and policy maker. And of course, the entrepreneurial spirit of the industry, as Sunil Mitchell and others have done things. That combination has worked. So you must allow the natural forces of competition to play. And as for your question on quality of experience, Gopal answered it very brilliantly for the morning. Uh, uh, Gopal, he gave the example. He's a he's a chair, he's a head of the biggest telco here. He said, "You can't make out a difference between a 30 Mbps and a 100 Mbps. Normal customer cannot. For his normal day-to-day -day requirement, a customer I cannot make out. I know that about 14 Mbps is minimum required for good video experience. If it goes beyond 14, I know." I will not be able to see any major difference. So 5G, 6G, all these are important, but they go into niche applications. So quality of experience is what matters. The metrics which you say that, okay, everything must meet this value of metric may not be to be. We should have, the regulator should allow the market to decide, the customers to decide. If there is enough competition, people will migrate. If you don't give me good quality, I'll go to another company for that. That's my simple answer to that. Mr. Watts, uh, you know, just coming back to the theme of this uh, discussion, I think we've, we've touched on a lot of things today and uh, it, it's hard to reconcile all these various threads. But coming back to it, uh, you know, do you agree that the future of the digital sphere is uh, better safeguarded if we work towards a framework where there are lower market entry barriers to each new market that... Um, uh, that we discover along the way, and in which case, uh, does it have any implication for how incumbents or legacy actors um, advocate their interests in the regulatory sphere? I mean, is it not incumbent on the incumbents to ask for uh, uh, for lower uh, barriers to entry in their markets, um, and therefore to uh, to find a level playing field, which is um, which is uh, helping us regulate downwards. Why do we, and this is not uh, limited to you, and there is, of course, this lock-in resource problem that you spent a, a bunch of money on uh, acquiring uh, expensive uh, public resources and, and built your business atop that. But so have, I mean, this problem extends to all regulated markets, perhaps. You see banks and fintechs, they have a similar discussion uh, where the RBI is torn between technology and taking care of uh, the, the key incumbent that ensures financial stability and the financial system uh, as a whole. Uh, you see this, uh, you know, across various spaces. You'll see it even in, uh, you know, a market like pharmacy, uh, where you know there's a tussle between the old distributors and the new distributors. Uh, so, is there a philosophy that can guide us out, and is it? lower market entry barriers, and if so, can we see that reflected in future discussions uh, around uh, telecom and OTT symbiotic relationship? Yeah, I think uh, it's a very uh, pertinent question for our panelists, you know, because uh, technology is really usurping 
the set rules which we had uh, in the past. Uh, the biggest problem uh, basically is the safety of the investments which you would have poured into the system. Typically a telco in India, if you are doing a pan-India coverage, covering all technologies, trying to meet a quality of service grade, you're spending around 40 to 50 billion dollars to set up a network. Uh, let me give you an analogy uh, which is really happening in the market right now. Uh, so we have purchased Spectrum at a huge cost to give a service, including, for example, uh, let's take a use case, uh, say IoT, smart metering. Uh, the regulator has also rightfully encouraged, uh, you know, the free market to step in, innovation to step in, and uh, they unlicense certain bands to say, okay, these bands are unlicensed for, you know, usage by others. Now, in the same unlicensed band, we are seeing smart metering also happening, right? Uh, so now you are in a situation where two networks are coming up simultaneously, doing the same application, absolutely same, but one has poured money of $10 billion to buy a spectrum and then do that service, and the other guy is just using unlicensed band and also doing the same service. So now this is the situation, because there has to be some monetization of the money which you had spent in. Right? So that is one you know, facet of this entire issue. The other facet of the issue is that are we creating robust and safe networks for the future? It's a very, very important issue. Uh, I was talking to uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a gentleman uh, from uh, uh, Kaspersky the other day, along with our national cyber security coordinator. And I was told uh, that typically, as for them, nearly more than four-fifths of phones in our country might be running on malware, right? Uh, so there are, uh, you know, issues around cybersecurity. Now, in smart metering, we have seen also cyber attacks happening. The AIMS network in Delhi went down for a month, and nobody, it was a ransomware attack, nobody could really, you know, patch it out. So are you creating networks which are safe and secure for the future, right? So when we are looking at new technologies, new innovations, we really have to create a framework of how you want this to be panned out. Because you cannot have two roads uh, of different grade of service going to the same destination, right? It will create, uh, you know, a lot of issues. And how much do you want people to compete in that space, right? So do you want uh, an unsecure network to also compete with you, a secure network? And then are you going to encourage one over the other, right? So that's what the real challenge, uh, you know, before us is, and then see how we really you know, come so, out. Mr. Vats, a very pertinent point. Uh, Gauri, I throw this to you. Uh, security by design or security of any network or, you know, uh, ecosystem, uh, there seems, there is an inherent conflict with uh, interconnectedness uh, and interoperability. And, uh, you know, uh, the construct of openness, which we are espousing, by the way, more than any other digital economy today, uh, through o open networks, through open uh, applications uh, like UPI, um, and so on and so forth. Um, is, are we somewhere, you know, uh, confusing issues? Is there a way to resolve this? Because the, one of the fundamental things, you know, one of the submissions uh, to the TRI's consultation paper was, I think, by one of the organizations that manages the internet. One of the NGO, many NGOs that manage the internet. I, I, there's a very nice construct there of the internet way of networking, which is that you don't want to create splinter nets because you feel like you have, you know, different unique problems in different parts of the internet. So if you, for instance, start taking carriage fees or network usage fees or whatever you want, interconnection fees, whatever you want to call it, you will create a different internet in India from that which operates in the OECD, for instance, maybe. Uh, similarly, if you have different national security uh, layers that are built into networks that are supposed to be harnessed and be interoperable uh, across the world, uh, then again, you you know you veer towards the sort of Chinese Russian model of the internet and of cybersecurity, where the solution to uh, threats from outside is to close uh, 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 close the gaps and, and you know clo uh, create walls. And sometimes we, you know the higher the wall you create, the more rigid the structure becomes, and it can fall down just as quickly as we've seen in Russia. So uh, you know just some thoughts on navigating these national security and uh, regulatory intersections, because they are also pertinent to how 
Digital India Act and various other efforts evolved. No, absolutely, and this you know became very prominent during the pandemic when we saw you know heightened cyber security issues and you know we had to really work a lot on on those aspects. I, and I completely agree with Mr. Vats here that whatever we do, I think security has to be kept at the highest. You know, whatever the compromises we need to do for that, overall, you know, from a business model or otherwise, because. Uh, uh, I mean, and, and that's a national security issue, right? Because uh, one weak link in the network uh, will take you down, right? I mean, uh, and there are, and especially when the, you know, if you really see where things are moving from here, quantum computing is coming up, right? So, and that will create havoc in the cyber security scheme of things. So I know we are running out of time. So just to, sim you know, keep it simple, definitely that is one area where we just can't ignore and looking at what are the need, what is the other development like quantum, which is likely to create, you know, more security issues. So these aspects, uh, you know, when we are liberalizing, seeing things light touch and this and that. But my personal view is cyber security, no light touch. That has to be, you know, at the at the highest. Uh, Mr. Raghunandan, uh, you know, why don't you have the last word? You've heard us all. Um, and if you would like to summarize instead uh, of me, you will save me the trouble. Uh, but it will also, we'll also be wiser for it. So if you would like to conclude, sir, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, of course, I have uh, responded to some of the interventions, like the limited uh, regulatory interventions as required. Security I have specifically mentioned and touched about it. And the collaborative approach, collaboration is the new mantra. And then collaboration, coexistence, and convergence. These are the things which, whether we accept or not, it is going to be the future of the way forward. I must say in, in all the telecom and other uh, networks. That is one thing. Definitely regulators need to innovate. And then we are constantly, actually, we are interacting with the various stakeholders. In fact, the metaverse, we were the first to interact on the metaverse issue way back, almost a year back. And then what are all the regulatory challenges which are going to come and what way we need to approach to make India to create an enabling environment without compromising in the security, privacy and all those things. And then how to go about that. So that is how the regulators have to be innovative. They have to be collaborative because they have to constantly interact. And as far as Mr. Rahul's uh, pain is concerned, so we often in the today's uh, discussion, we mentioned about indirectly about the DTS sector and then about uh, their, we, we agree that uh, there is a legacy, there are legacy issues and uh, Try has been actually recommending how to actually uh, step back in those legacy issues and then see that their concerns are addressed, well addressed, so that there is a, the, the issue of level playing field because it is in the mind because they are actually different network, they were governed by the legacy issues. So Mr. Ramachandran has touched the same point. Because any innovations they are good, fine because there is there are the legacy issues. So the last year, last before year, union cabinet has rightly addressed some of the legacy issues of SLC has been removed and then uh, certain bank guarantees, etc. The try has been recommended. In fact, some ma majority of them try has recommended. And we continue to work on certain already we have re received the consultations, references we have received about the entry barriers. Again, we are working on that. So definitely we will continue to see that the level playing field is achieved at a certain point of time, not overnight re re removing this, uh, this legacy issues is not practical or possible because the government was sustaining on the li license fee and then suddenly removing any roadmap. So we are, we will see how that is to be addressed. So this is what actually I must say that the moment these things are addressed, the future will be definitely very flying and then I am very confident that this will become a non-issue that is uh, OTT versus telecom. The, after two years, Mr. Vastan, the two, three years, if this issue is settled, so sir, they don't, let us not discuss this topic. You will not find in the discussion points at all. I am very confident about it. Let's hope that this is thank a tactical you. discussion then. And uh, thank you very much uh, to all the panelists.